Um, thanks, first of all, for everyone for joining us. Uh, so excited to kick off this uh, kind of series. We're calling them Ed Chats, and it's really just my own intellectual playground because I'm obsessed with all things AI. Uh, and so I'm so appreciative of you all allowing me to indulge uh, this. Um, I uh, This is actually secretly not a conversation about AI. It's actually the first uh, meeting of the Deborah Wilson fan club, of which I'm the president. So uh, <laughs> this also, you know, that's my real motivation. Uh, but I'm so excited, so appreciative of the wonderful Deborah Wilson, who is joining us currently the uh, executive director, president of the Southern Association of Independent School, and soon to be the president of the National Association of Independent Schools. Um, so I'm just so excited to dive into this and um, uh, pick your brain about all things uh, AI. Before I do, I want to make a couple quick uh, uh, housekeeping notes before I forget. We are recording this, so we will uh, uh, share afterwards. This is a series, and so um, uh, we'll also uh, uh, share out after this um, uh, more information about some other chats that we have coming up. The next one, I know, uh, forgive me because I've already forgotten my own date, but it's in June. Martin McKay is the CEO of Text Help, which is an adaptive technology company. Really cool stuff. So I'm super pumped to hear uh, his perspective. Um, and then we have other things lined up from there. I will also plug, because right now this is largely an audience of, of folks um, who are uh, part of LD schools throughout the country. So thank you all for being here. LD schools, you also uh, got an invitation today to join AIM Academy and Landmark School um, at the ISTE conference. So ISTE, the technology conference is in Philadelphia. And as part of that, uh, we're gonna have an AI think tank, um, which is about as far as we've gotten with an agenda is that it's gonna be a think tank, which sounds super impressive. So that should be in your inbox for those that uh, are interested. So with all that, Deborah, I'm just gonna kind of jump in. And as I said to you, I, I, I want this to be super casual. Um, I have all kinds of places I wanna go, uh, uh, but we'll just go wherever the conversation takes us and feel free to interject and steer us or ask me a question, wh whatever works for you. As we launch in, the one thing I've always wanted to do, I always thought if I got to interview a bunch of interesting people, I'd always want to start by asking about their own kind of relationship to school, right? I mean, like school is such a defining part for both of us, but for it's one of the few things that unites pretty much every uh, uh, every Western uh, uh, you know piece of civilization. So, just curious to start with, what's your relationship to school? What was school like for you? Um. What was school like for me? That's kind of an interesting question. I um, am from a pretty big education family. My parents are both first generation to go to college. Like, so education was very much part and parcel of everything. My mom actually has a PhD in nursing research and she's been a teacher as long as I can remember. She used to teach nursing at the local community college near our house. And her students would actually practice like wrapping up our arms and legs and things. They had this like whole like kind of fake nursing room with the hospital beds and things, you know, I mean, so it, I don't know, like learning and education has sort of always been around in, in our house. Um, I have a very funny school memory. I don't think I've told many people about this. I, I was in first grade. I was kind of an intense kid. That doesn't surprise anybody. Who knows. <laughs> so, um, I, I was in first grade and I'd gone to kindergarten at the school. It's John Moriarty school. It's a little public school in Norwich, Connecticut. And I loved my kindergarten teacher. I actually went to a Montessori's preschool. I loved that. But I remember in first grade, like, you know, we're sitting at a desk. It's like the first time I sat at a desk. And I remember looking at my shoes and thinking like, okay, you know, this is the real, this is the big time. Like I'm in real school. And so like, I have to do well. And I was just very driven that way at a strangely young age. Like, I, I don't know what I, I mean, I had two older siblings. My older sister is almost six years older than I am. So I, I kind of wonder if just seeing them kind of do more grown up school, like really kind of drove into my head that, yeah, you know, once you've got a desk and people are talking about desks, like that was a, a big deal. Um, and then when I went to the Williams School in Connecticut, it's like my, my independent school, I started in seventh grade. And that was, it was, you know, I, I would visit there a lot. So if I had days off and my siblings didn't, a lot of times I would go and shadow them or shadow somebody else. And so when I started at Williams, it was a really, it was a little, probably a little bit unusual. My, my brother was president of his sophomore class in high school. And my sister was actually president of the student body. Um, so yeah, like no pressure. Yeah. Uh, and, um, 
but my parents were also separating at the same time. So it was like a really kind of, it was very much a homey place. Like everybody knew my siblings, you know, I was a pretty familiar, my whole class was a class of littles. So most of my good friends had older siblings in my siblings classes. So we were a pretty familiar group, uh, much to them, sure the consternation and pain of the administration because you know, nobody could tell us anything, particularly like once we got into like eighth and ninth grade, like we were a terrible, terrible class in some ways. Um, really wonderful in a lot of ways, but also I'm sure we were a handful. Um, and, you know, so that, and and those years were really formative. The, the support the school gave me in particular, you know, my parents were the original sort of divorced parents. Um, you know, this was the eighties. They were sort of um, ahead of the trends and it, you know, just the support of the school and the understanding of um, just what that looked like, I think, was really important. And um, yeah, and I've still kept in touch, you know, if you look at the Gallup wellness things about staying in touch with, you know, your college professors and stuff, I've done that, but I'm actually still in touch with a good number of my high school teachers. And, you know, it's, um, and actually some of my elementary school teachers now that I think about it. So it's, you know, school for me has always been a pretty special, supportive, an exciting place. That's great. That's very cool. And thank you for sharing that. Um, I know I didn't put that on a list of potential topics. So. No, it's good. I mean, I, I uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I've got unlimited stories of things that have happened in school. So it's <laughs> been a pretty key part of my life. I think, uh, yeah, I think he gets this one thing that unites almost all of us, right? Uh, yeah. And it's so formative in so many ways. And I love thinking of like little Deborah at her desk, right? And that's kind of your, you know, and now the question is, is it next? Like when I get my VR headset. That's when I really know I'm, I, you know, school's actually starting. Right, right. Have you really arrived when you have like a whole bodysuit, like kind right. of, you know, um, oh, what is that? What is that movie? My son would be like killing me. Uh, Ready Player One. You Ready know, Player they, One. Oh, yeah. Whole body, you know, and they're in, in the whole thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. The next I, God, I hope not, Josh, but I mean, it could go that way. <laughs> <laughs> I so kind of with that. So when thinking about this, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm obsessed with AI. I've read everything I can find. And even as I was preparing for this, I find it almost paralyzing because there's just so much. I don't even know where to begin. But one thing I thought might be helpful, just recognizing that there's a variety of folks on this call with a variety of uh, backgrounds in this. How do you define AI for a minute? Just, for, and maybe even for the purposes of this conversation, how, how will you define AI? Yeah, you know, I loved when I was looking at that question, I love that, that question because you know, there's artificial intelligence, there's artificial general intelligence, there's like chatbots, there's all these things. To, to me, AI is anything that um, it can, can learn. So it's not, and I don't mean that in a sentient kind of way, right? But it, it's, you know, it scrapes data, it scrapes images, and it, and it can start to put those things together, and it can recognize patterns really well. So you know, there's now AI that, that are reading mammograms, and they can, they, you know, really, really well. It can start to pick up patterns. It understands it can learn a lot through more medical records than any one human could ever review in their lives. And it's not that you're replacing the human in that, but you've got a system that's actually really screening for that in a different kind of way. And so when I think of AI, and I'm, I'm with you, I love to play with this. Like I played with Dolly, I played with ChatGTP, GPT, I'm on ChatGPT4. I'm playing around with all the Google stuff. Like I love all of these just different things and learning. And I love to try to trip it up. I love to just kind of play with, okay, what can it get wrong? And, um, you know, and I, and I don't actually think it's something we can escape now. Like I think actually AI is built into more things already than we can reasonably see. Um, so, and that's, both exciting and terrifying to me, but I, but I think about them as, you know, systems that are, are learning and then generally being applied for, you know, to, to a thing. Um, and most of the stuff I think that we get to play with online for people who are deep in that space, like where we are, you know, we are me sitting in a first grade chair going like, okay, like I'm gonna do this. Like, yeah, that's that's how I think about AI. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with all that. And I love your comment too, right? The things that we're playing with that are blowing our minds are like the most, you know, immature version of this possible. So imagine what actually exists and what will exist, right? Yes. Um, and so I, I, I completely agree I, with your definition. And the thing that I will add for myself that I think about is 
uh, you know, AI is something that can learn. It can solve complex problems. And what's fascinating to me is it can do it in a way that feels very human. So that to me is also like the mind blowing part of this. It's not just what it can do. It's that it feels like my mom just did it, right? You know, or whatever it is. Whatever tone you're looking for, whatever, whatever flavor. Yes, it is, you know, um, for those of us sort of space odyssey to, you know, you yes. know, this highly irregular, like, you know, I mean, just you expect it to to talk to you. And we do that a little bit already, right? Like we do it with our smart speakers and things like that, but this is taking it to sort of a disturbing next level, yeah. really. All right, so let's jump into that. Let's let's get disturbed. So uh, you mentioned exciting and terrifying at the same time. Let's start with what do you, from what you've known, what you've seen, what you think about, what excites you about AI and schools? What what is the opportunity that you you potentially see? Yeah, I mean, I um, so I, I have a thirteen year old, so I love to. You know, she's like my test water case, right? Like I love just to see how she lives, and she. I have two older kids too, but she lives with technology very differently. You know. She'll come bopping downstairs and she'll have her iPad and, you know, and I know she's sewing a quilt or something up in her room, but she'll have her friend with her and her friend is, she's got a friend who's a dancer, maybe like, you know, sewing ribbons on her point shoes or whatever. And they, they flow from one thing to another with technology and they're with each other all the time through it. And not, interestingly, her generation's not that social media interested really, but they're just connected differently. They think about technology differently. And they're not afraid to learn from it. And, you know, for me, exciting and terrifying are usually like they're, they're pretty closely aligned. You know, she's in algebra now. And so we were talking to some of the issues she was having with algebra. And I said, well, why don't you ask chat GPT? Like chat GPT will, it'll talk about quadratic equations in any tone you want. It'll do it in iambic pentameter. Like, I mean, it is wild to me and it never runs out of patience, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a I have a friend in the ed tech world and they're working on a platform. And the entry fee will be pretty low. And you know, eventually you could probably kick it in. You know, Canvas will adapt an AI interface at some point in time. And so when kids get home, you know, this sort of home tutor will basically say, Hey, you have a science test. Do you want to practice some of the science questions for your test on Tuesday? And kind of help organize that and talk to them, sort of Iron Man Jarvis style. And parents will be able to go in and sort of set like, these are things I never want you to talk to my kid about. Like, we're just taking that off the table. These are the things that are, you know, that are really okay. This is the kind of tone my student responds to. This is what I want to see. Like, you know, and it's um, that that kind of one-on-one -on -one attention and that one-on-one -on -one tutoring, I think is going to be really helpful to kids. And particularly around questions where, when they haven't gotten it, right? Like, and they don't want to ask the teacher again, or they might be embarrassed or whatever. And when those those feeds, that data can start actually feeding back into the teacher about what student what questions the student has, like places where they're struggling. And the teacher can use that to work with the rest of the class too, because chances are usually like if one or two kids are missing something, there's probably more of them that just aren't even thinking that far. So I think um, that ability for students to more readily have access to you know good tutors around these things or good in initial lessons i don't think it'll ever replace the teacher but i think it will supplement teachers and i think teachers will probably move particularly as kids get older more into kind of coaching facilitating and leaning much more on those relationship pieces and models which we know through research particularly through the pandemic are so incredibly crucial to education right i mean i think that that to me is really exciting particularly as we talk about personalized learning. So, you know, my daughter's, she's in seventh grade, she's doing algebra. And, you know, one thing her school really struggles with is, um, you know, how do we meet these needs of kids who are really ready to move along in math or in ELA or whatever, or kids who are not ready? Like, how do we personalize some of this education and, and make sure they're learning the things that we need without overstretching our staff? And we've been so bound by age and time and time and seats. And this will allow us, I think, to flex a lot more. At the same time, I think we're really going to struggle with that as an industry. Like that's like, how do we work with technology? Um, ASU GSV is a great conference. If anybody's interested in going, I'll be there next year. I've been there a couple of times. You and I have talked about ASU GSV before. And one of the panels, somebody said, you know, AI is not going to 
take people's jobs. People who know how to work with AI, mm -hmm. they're going to take people's jobs. And mm -hmm. I do think like in schools, as these AI tools develop and like figuring out like how do we use those to supplement what we do and potentially accelerate what we do and meet, meet the needs of students. I mean, I think those are going to be big. So that, that tutoring piece and then supporting the great work of our teachers and, and really utilizing those relationships and what makes them special and like freeing up some of their time, I think is going to be crucial with AI. But I mean, what do you think is exciting, Josh? Like, I, I think it's kind of cool. And I actually, I mean, there's, there's the easy stuff that will replace teacher time too, right? Like, right. and I know we're all supposed to be like, no, every teacher recommendation, you know, should be like grown in a hot house and like, but I've talked to some teachers and they're like, sometimes I just need, I need a rough draft to start working from. And I can give them a list of all of this kid's strengths and the wonderful things they've done. And, you know, writing is not my thing. And chat GPT will at least give them a draft of something to start from. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I completely agree. One thing you just said that I hadn't thought about that I love is on this kind of personal tutor side, which I totally agree with. And I can go down that rabbit hole, but I hadn't really considered or thought about that feedback mechanism to the teacher, right? That's really funny to think about that, like kind of you're almost auditing or getting a front row seat of homework, but in a way that's super time efficient, right? That's, you know, I, I hadn't thought about that. I, I That's really cool. Um, over the weekend, I started playing with Conmingo. Conmingo? I think I'm saying it right. Have you played with Conmingo? I haven't played with it yet, but I've read about it. Yeah. It's super cool. Um, uh, so this is, you know, the Khan Academy is kind of personal tutor. Right. Um, and, and one thing I keep, I have to keep reminding myself in, in these conversations too is, you know, and I'll, Khan Academy thing's really neat. Every now and then it's a little, you know, uh, rusty. And you're like, oh man. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard like mixed reviews. I'm sure I'm not supposed to say that out loud, but I actually was on an email exchange with a couple of friends, one of whom loves all things Khan Academy. And the other one likes Khan Academy and has really played in depth with this tool and this friends in ed tech. And he's like, yeah, it's not there yet. Like it's- right. But that's the thing is, it's not there yet. And like, and we're so quick to be like, oh, this is never going to work. This, this won't, this won't. You oh, know. I'm not a never going to work. Like right. that's like next week could blow the doors off. And like, yeah. Yes. Because yes. I believe it's coming, right? It's coming. And I, so from my seat, I th there's a couple of things that intrigue me. From an LD standpoint, right? I really do think this is going to be able to help teach kids to read in a way that right now, because of knowledge and manpower and cost and resources, you know, da, 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 outside of kids who are, you know, have the benefit of coming to a school like Landmark and so many of the schools on this call right now, I think, I think it's going to really be able to, to your point, to differentiate at a level that is also responsive. That's the crazy part, right? And so I think that's mind blowing. Um, and I have a question about that in a second. But then I also, um, I, I, well, I'm going to go to my question because I don't know what I was going to say also. Um, so with that, though, I want to dig a little bit more, too, in this idea of, I know I'm with you. I don't think it's going to replace teachers, but I think it could, I think it could, I don't want to, I don't want to say radically change because I feel like that's a loaded and fair, but dramatically, if you will, if it's not going to, I think it could dramatically change how we think about teaching. Would you yes. agree with that? Yeah, I, um, I think it will radically change it I think you'll see more of a coaching model in teaching and particularly a little bit earlier than we probably see it now um I and I again I think that personalization for students and that ability to kind of cross data so like you know when kids are in the same again all my kids have gone to Montessori school so multi-age classrooms, you know, really being able to track like where they come together with kids who are at the same point where they might move apart and kind of blend in with other kids. I just, I, I think it's going to um, make that much clearer for us from a data perspective. And I think it'll allow teachers to organize their times in different ways. One, and I'm, I'm actually writing a thing for our newsletter that goes out on Thursday. One of the fundamental things I'm worried about, and I think everybody in education is worried about right now is the workforce, right? Like, and what does that look like? And how do we build in some flexibility? You know, as we look at this next generation coming up and we're just looking at turnover and burnout and just teacher time, where does that give? There was a fascinating study that came out last year. I'll send you the link so you can send it out with the recording. And it, and it, it's going to make your head hurt because it just takes the way we think about staffing anything and just turns it on its head. But 
you know, I think AI will enable us to meet some of those needs of those upcoming generations in terms of providing some flexibility, providing more teacher training time and, and meeting the needs of students better. You know, when you're talking about education and how it's something we all have in common, the other thing we all have in common is we only have one shot of education, right? I mean, I tell schools this all the time. The longer you keep a teacher around who you know is just not cutting it, not really serving students, we've only got one shot of fourth grade. So like, how do we make that the best fourth grade experience that they can possibly have? Um, and I think that this will actually enable that a little bit more. One thing I hadn't thought about until I was listening to you speak was like, there is the ability with AI, I think, to customize it for our schools, for our missions, for our tone. You know, when you go into different schools and you go into different classrooms, you know, you've got sort of your secret sauce and your like flavor of what that feels like and looks like. Um, you know, you, you know, you even going, you know, from skanked up to landmark, right? Like mm -hmm. you're not doing dissimilar things necessarily, but those two are, they're two different schools or two different institutions. The culture feels different. The classroom feels different. And so the idea of working with a tool that can work hand in hand with the teacher and capture some of that tone and that flavor and understand students that way, I think is going to be really powerful. So I'm, I'm really hopeful for all of those things, but I think it is going to change how we have traditionally thought about teacher and teachers and teaching, particularly when you start bringing in other technology that is, you know, just busting at the seams and coming for us all soon in a positive kind of way. Right. And I think coming for us all is the way to put it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I completely, so, and one thing I will also say again, from my vantage point, I spend, in addition to running a school, I spend so much time, energy, resources, like so many people on this call, trying to get adults to do something differently than the way they've always done it in order to enable kids to read. And if I can bypass all that, if I, oh my gosh. So I also, to your point, I, I think this, I, I think the customization of this could be revolutionary in so many ways. On a whole nother topic, maybe later on, I also, I, I to your point about we could customize this to our mission and our feel and who we are, I think that's going to be fascinating and important because what happens when we can all deliver a similar level of rigor or differentiation, right. including our public schools? What is What becomes the differentiator, which I, I want to get to in a moment, but before I do, um, question and then follow up. There's been a lot of things in my you know, relatively short period, short career in the grand scheme of things that were going to change education, change right? the universe, yes. It's all going to happen. Like, I still remember, I still remember being in a conference in Nashville, I think it was at Harpeth Hall, and like hearing about this book, The World is Flat, right? And, and I think I shared my article that, did you know, and you know, there's more information in the New York Times than, you know, someone would have had in their whole life. And then, and I mean, it did, but it didn't, it, but yeah. Do you, do you feel like, and then COVID obviously was going to change everything. We were never going to go back the way that we did. And then we have just spent all this time trying to figure out how to do carpool like we used to, as if we really <laughs> it. Um, it wasn't that great before. <laughs> I know, but God, we think it is. Um, so question is, do you think this is going to be as impactful as some of the hype implies? And what, and you already touched on, we're going to have a hard time with that. And I would love to get your thoughts on what just schools, what that looks like. Yeah, I, um, so, I mean, I think, I, I agree with articles, like, it's going to be like this kind of, and it, it's already impacting us in ways we can't see. One of the things that troubles me the most is I think it will continue to impact us in ways that we can't see and we won't really understand. I've loved this debate bubbling up about, okay, how dangerous is this and, you know, and our AI overlords and all of this other stuff, because these are really smart people who think deep thoughts about these things, and they are really getting into it with each other about is this safe like is this smart should we be doing this i mean but i i i do think it will fundamentally change how we do things that being said there's always going to be some people who are like nope i'm like we're sticking with the traditional way this is the way we're going to do it this has worked for any number of kids over time and and i think that's fine but i think what you're going to see you know, it's a herd mentality. Like you just did a few of the cows start kind of turning. And there was a, there's a book you probably, you might or may not remember this, a book a long time ago called Wikonomics and Pat Bassett was huge. Oh, yeah. on this book. And, and he talked about uh, the global industrial floor. And we have in fact been seeing this coming. 
right? So like these like modules that plug into different things. So, you know, Boeing is not too far from my house. Um, and parts, you know, the Dreamlifter brings in parts and they put the planes together and they come from all over the place. That doesn't change like where Boeing puts planes together or how they put planes together, but it's just a different way of doing it. And in education, like we've seen things like Project Lead the Way. Uh, we've seen like the dual degree things popping up. You see GOA in one schoolhouse. These ways to kind of plug in different platforms, different concepts, different curricula, whatever it is, into our overall picture. And if you do it, if you kind of embrace that and can make that work for you, I mean, Project Lead the Way is a great example. You don't have to create your entire engineering curriculum from pre-K through 12. They'll train your teachers. You can like tweak those things. It networks teachers on the back end. Schools that use it, a lot of them have been really, really happy with it. Independent schools, public schools. And I think AI is going to work like that. But how you personalize it, and I actually think how you're talking with kids about how to think about AI and helping them recognize like what's real and really how to bring critical thinking to the table to actually understand if what they're getting from AI, particularly when you get, frankly, into some of those deeper humanities questions, is the real thing. This is not a sentient being. It doesn't, it feels like it when you're asking it, hey, help me plan my five-year-old's birthday party or whatever weird thing you come up with, but it's not. And so, and I do think actually those, when you look at those 21st century skills and you look at, you know, that content skills and character, you know, center for curriculum redesign, that how we think about character and how we think about skills in particular, those are going to be huge pieces of the value that we bring to the table. And being really deliberate around that, I think is going to be crucial, truly, truly important. Yeah, I think so, so much of that. Um, uh, one thing, before I forget to your point, about it's not, you know, it's not, it's not sensing it, right? It can't, I, I, that's something that fascinates me that I'm reading a lot about is how we, how our definition of what divides us from this, what continues to make it artificial, right? So, um, uh, you know, and one of the things being that, you know, it, 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 it can't feel, it doesn't have a sense of ethics, it doesn't, you know, da, 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 um, which all makes sense. But there was a time in human history where that's how we divided ourselves from animals, right? We could reason. We could do all these things on this that now that AI can do, and is it just fascinating? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It does start to bring in that question. I um, one thing I actually I get a huge kick out of an AI. I always say it's like it reminds me of me like my sophomore year in high school. Like it will make stuff up given the opportunity. Like I don't know the answer to that, so I'm just going to create something. And right. you know, it doesn't it doesn't withstand a whole lot of poking and questioning. But like if you don't stop and poke and question it, it'll just, you know, it'll keep going down that road with you for as long as you're ready to go down it. Yeah. Yep. Well, it's interesting when you said that uh, in terms of what this could mean, right? And you held up your iPhone as the example, and I, I completely agree, maybe even more so, um, uh, which we can get into, but how many of us, our lives have become, our professional lives have become more complicated and tiresome because of this damn thing. And how many of us continue to try to act as if it doesn't have a place within the schoolhouse, right? That this, and I, that's the other piece to me that's, I, I don't think we're going to be able to draw as firm of a line with this because it is going to infiltrate and be so ubiquitous. Because I also, one of the things that I find interesting about this, and I would have to think about that, the iPhone did it too, but maybe in a different way. I, I think this could fundamentally change the way of work. Yes. And if our job is to prepare you for that, and we can all act like we're here to make great character, and it's all true to some degree, but if you don't have a job, you know, we're not really doing ours. So I think there's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see an acceleration of change at the, in the workplace that will mirror or impact or that we're going to have to catch up with in a way that I don't think, I can't think of another, with the exception of the internet, but even that I think was a slightly slower rollout than we might potentially see um, that work's going to change incredibly quickly. So education's not going to be in a place to be as reticent or as kind of slow moving as we've been in the past. Does that make sense? You, do you think that's true? Yeah, I, you know, I do think that's true. And now you're making me, I actually have a, like a deck open in front of me and I'm going to see if I can find that slide as I'm speaking. There, um, I worry, so, you know, you held up your iPhone 
And, and my question for you, and this is sort of, a, it's almost like a daring question for me to ask you because you're much more likely to have done this well than I have. I have no idea how, how to do half of the cool things this phone can do. Right. Like no idea, like really like no clue. Uh, you know, my kids kind of play around with this, but I think, I think technology is accelerating so much more quickly now than it ever has like in human history, we're at a different point of, you know, we're, you know, a different tale of the industry, of the technology revolution, right? And so how as, as people, as humans in the workforce, like how do we keep up with that? So just when I, you know, I was talking about my older two kids and my younger one, the way she does technology is totally different than the way that they do it. And they're only so many years apart. It's much more integrated into her life. My mom was actually, and she's, I'm not going to say how old she is because she'll get mad. Um, she was one of the first people I know who taught online, you know, and even now getting into her octogenarian years, she teaches continuing nursing online even now. She's kind of a rarity to have kept up with technology as much as she has. But this is, so this is the slide. If you, if you make me a, maybe a co-host or if somebody can make me a co-host, I'll, sh I'll share this slide. And it, it actually talks about cost and price changing. Um, and there we go, perfect. Okay, good. And um, I won't show any other slides, but these two. So um, this was from a study and it, and it talks about selected US consumer goods and services and wages. And, and look at where like kind of you're seeing like education, right? And these are these are the places that have gathered technology for better or worse, right? Like fast fashion, what a climate hot mess that makes, all those things, toys, same kind of thing, right? But if we don't get our hands around this and use it for the good of education and students and things, this is literally, this is a quote from this article. We are heading into a world where a flat screen TV that covers your entire wall costs $100 and a four-year college degree costs a million dollars and nobody... Mm -hmm has anything even resembling a proposal on how to systemically fix this, right? And that, this is what I think about at three o'clock in the morning. Um, I worry about being left behind from a technology standpoint, personally, but also in a variety of ways as an industry, because we don't see these changes in the same way that other industries do. And higher ed is kind of the same way, right? Like we're not we're not in other businesses. My son is studying industrial engineering, which is kind of like systems engineering. And his head is like exploding every day with what AI can do and learn from systems and like how to improve upon the systems and efficiencies. We don't really talk about that a whole lot as an industry. And so I'm I'm worried that if we don't kind of embrace some of this and, and start playing with it and figuring it out, that we will be left behind and we we will have that million dollar degree when it's all said and, and done. And if if what we really want to do is is you know transformative educational experiences in our schools, I think we want to make sure that it remains affordable and hopefully make us more accessible and not less. Yeah. No, I think that's such a good point. That's a terrifying slide, um, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you know, at 3 a.m. you can text me and be like, oh, hey, I'm, I'm up thinking about the slide. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I mean, you're right. I mean, you're 100 percent right. You know what? ISM years ago did that whole thing about we hit, we crossed 50,000, and nothing happened with tuition and people. But th there's a there's an end point. There's no question. There's an end point, and four percent of a big number becomes bigger and bigger, right? As as we go forward. So I completely agree. And I think that's what also among many things, and we can talk about our worries here maybe now. Among the many things that worry about AI, from existential destruction to I think one of the biggest barriers to education, one of our biggest challenges for all of us is nostalgia. And we just have this belief of what this is supposed yeah. to be and look like, right? Because it's so foundational, right? You at your desk, you know, you need, how could they not have a desk? That's what shaped me. And so I, I think we got to start thinking a little bit differently ab about this in general and, and, and offering kids experiences that are just Different, And I don't know if this is an example, but it, to me, it's one of the perplexing things that I'm trying to navigate right now, on a, or I did personally. So when we, you know, we moved, we moved from Atlanta to Massachusetts, north of Boston, two kids, 10 and 13, right? My daughter, who is much more social and, uh, uh, you know, I, I thought she'd have the easiest time and she didn't. 
And at first she FaceTimed with her best friend from Atlanta every day. And I thought, thank God. When I was little and we moved, I just never saw those people again. This is so great. But that enabled a point where we had to stop it because she didn't know how to make new friends because, or she wouldn't, I know she wouldn't. She's got all of her old friends, yes. And I had no idea how the heck to help her because I'd never lived that experience that. And in my gut reaction was, thank God you get to do this. How wonderful. Yeah, of course you can have more screen time. And anyway, and I was totally wrong. So I, I say all that to say that this is, uh, we some, in some way we have to fundamentally rethink how, not what, but, or not why maybe, but the how could dramatically change. And we kind of have to step out of the way of that to some degree. Well, and, and to see, you know, to recognize the humanness that comes into play, right? So, you know, there's, there's a cool course at Georgetown right now, it's biology, but they, I'm pretty sure I have this right. They, they, they now have a, the biology teacher teaching biology, but they also have a psychology teacher and they're talking about human development. Um, because you don't have, you know, we're talking about human biology, like you, you need that other, you know, development piece of psychological development. And now they teach those things hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, one of the, there have been some kind of interesting studies around social media and obviously, you know, how bad that can be for people and things. And I read an article a while ago and they're talking about, it was like a little bit of speculation of, you know, the problem with social media is you, you, you can't leave anybody behind. Like you're carrying those people mm. all the time. I mean, if you choose to do that and, you know, and you can look at your friend list and it can be populated with people you went to grammar school with or whatever, you know, whatever the thing was. And so like, how do we take the, the good of technology and, and just recognize like its potential foibles? You know, when is it unhealthy to be maintaining those long distance friendships so much? And it's actually not that new of a problem, right? Like you go to college, you know, you're still dating your significant other. Eventually, like you don't have the significant other anymore because now you're in college and so are they or they're doing whatever they're doing. It's a problem we've all dealt with or had our kids deal with or whatever the thing is, but now they never actually have to break up really because they can FaceTime constantly. So like, what are we feeding and how are we talking about in-person relationships versus online relationships and, and, and that piece. And I, I think we can't forget that human part. And the sooner we talk with our kids about it, particularly if you're introducing AI, right? Kids can now jump on and ask ChatGPT anything. Right. And I think we're going to have to explicitly teach it in ways that we haven't, right? Back to that, how, how education and the role of a teacher is going to change. Because I also think sooner than later, we're going to have companions that are completely, you know, totally AI that know us, that don't challenge us, that reinforce, you know, and having to explicitly teach kids the difference between these things. Right. I am. Um, Yesterday, I, not, so now again, getting to the terrifying parts of all this, I watched <laughs> a, a keynote, and forgive me because I can't ever remember the gentleman's name, but it's the, the gentleman who wrote um, Sapiens and Homo Sapiens, and yeah, yeah. we all know him, right? And he's a, a bit of an alarmist around AI, right? He did that New York Times article, did, yep, uh, yep. and I think it was like the Frontiers, he was at some keynote in the last week, and he, and it was fascinating because the whole conference, he started by, this whole conference is about climate change. I'm not talking about climate change. I'm talking about AI. <laughs> I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about. Exactly. Right. But his point is, that was a, he really drove home this idea that it doesn't need to become sentient, sentient or whatever. We don't, the, the danger is not necessarily the Terminator, right? Maybe one day, but right. The, the fact that it can control language, we are under indexing what that means. And the examples that he gave to me that were really helpful is he, he said, you know, we, before AI, we had really smart people who believe really stupid things. Before AI, we believed that elections were stolen and that vaccines had chips in them and, you know, debt to debt to debt to debt. And he used, you know, QAnon as an example. And he said, this was all like, you know, deep internet, Q drops, da, da. this was, you know, and look what it, look what came of it. Imagine something much more sophisticated, much more, you know, What's that going to mean? And how do we prepare our kids for that world? 
um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, are we gonna get to a place where kind of constructing ideas or constructing knowledge is not, is deconstructing it is equally and maybe even more important, right? Because the, the ideas of them, we have to understand the how was it composed? What was its motive? You know, all these things, almost more so than originality, which is a kind of a weird, freaky thing to think about. Yeah, I um, I think all of that is true. It becomes that much more important who is pulling on the strings, right? I mean, and we've probably learned more about that, you know, as we've seen our knowledge consolidated, right? Like we've learned more about like, okay, well, who are the people who own all these newspapers or own all, you know, I mean, and, and what are their beliefs and how is that being driven from the back end? What does that tell me about the motivations behind what I'm reading or what I'm watching or hearing at any given point in time? And I, and I think that's, that's going to be harder to see, you know, somebody can take this recording of the two of us, right. take our voices and make us say anything, right? They can take the video and make it look like we're saying those things. Like, like it, it will actually be hard for you and I later to be like, well, I don't remember saying that, but what? it looks like me. It certainly sounds like me. I mean, who knows what it could be. Right. And that is the stuff that truly terrifies me because how do you teach kids? And this is why I think there's a big call for government regulation and all of these things. Like, how do you parse that apart? Right. Right. You know, I mean, because it can get planted anywhere. They can do just about anything to it. And so, you know, I worry less about, you know, AI overlords than I worry about people with nefarious ends using AI to manipulate for their own purposes. And I, I my suspicion is that's already happening. Like we've seen like little windows of it, little snippets of it. And I think that's going to get much worse. And so, you know, cybersecurity and cyber technology starts to get a lot more interesting if you start thinking about, okay, well, how do we lock down this video and this recording of us? Right. You know, how do you, how do you secure that so somebody can't steal it? Um, my son was talking about going to law school the other day. I was like, and he was talking about IP law. I was like, man, drive it like you stole it. Like, <laughs> you're going to be busy for a really long time. You want to yeah, yeah, yeah. combine engineering with um, a law degree? Like, you got a lot of runway in front of you. Right. Well, I, yeah, I, I completely, completely agree. And I, so I also think as schools, that's where we're, if we are having conversations about banning chat or it's cheating, or, all that is missing. The whole point of this, it is going to be used. How can we use it ethically, responsibly? And, and how can we, I, I think we're just gonna have to spend so much more time to your point about motives and understanding where this information coming from and what's that person's motive? You know, I, I remember, I'll never forget when I was a junior and a sophomore in high school, uh, in English, we're reading um, Withering Heights, right? And the, yeah. the story, remember, the first word is I. So we open it up and it's just I. And then she closes it. And she, what does I tell us? What does that mean? To, and, and the whole point was it was an unreliable narrator. But I was thinking, what in the hell is wrong with this person? We have read a <laughs> word. We've read a letter. Right. Right. I'm going to hate this class. But it was this whole idea of, you know, kind of motivation, right? Um, and that's going to come back in this very real way. Um, have you heard about the whole, like, um, AI in the sell the best paper clip or sell the most paper clips. Have you, yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Mike Flanagan actually at MTC does a great talk on that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. So that's so. If you don't, if you're not familiar, my rudimentary understanding of it, you know, AI is very goal oriented and it has no because it's not sentient. It has no concept of moral, you know, consequence. Right? So if you programmed AI to sell the most paper clips. And as an example, it finds that paperclip sales go up after a disaster. There would, in theory, be nothing preventing it from wanting to create a, an artificial disaster in order to sell more paperclips, right? Or to convince someone to kill the, your you know, rival paperclip CEO because, you know, that, that, oh, <laughs> right, right, right. But yeah. it's also kind of true. That's, that's, it's not as science fiction-y as we think or want it to be. Yeah, there's... Um... I think I can do this. I'm going to actually, I'm going to put it in the chat um, and I'm going to do this as a, or maybe I can't do this. You might be able to do this. Um, there's a, 
this this is actually a link to a New York Times opinion piece, and and this talk was actually given at my alma mater for graduation this past week, and it and it just talks about like anytime somebody is driving you to be to be angry or sad or mad or take action, you know you always have to to pause right and say like okay, why are they trying to get me to move in that direction, and like what is it that I want to do versus what am I responding to whatever the stimulus is, and you know, when you're talking about technology, like it doesn't think like that, like technology is never going to parse. It's just going to do what it, you tell it to do. And that's really why, I mean, I go back to like character education and student wellness. Like I think your, your ability to know yourself and to be centered in your world as, I mean, I think we've all seen how people are struggling with that now. I think that's going to get more important, not less going forward as we're managing this world that has so much technology really enabling the way that we live, right? But we we need that, we need those character traits driving how this is developed and how it's used and, and who's directing the technology because yep. that's gonna be crucial to overall wellness for humankind and much of the planet, right? I mean, yeah, you can you can run the table when you play risk, but you know we have much higher stakes now. Yeah, yeah, I think and your the wellness piece. I think you're so right, and I think that's I think that's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out, and does that become the value proposition of independent schools in a way that SAT, ACT, all that used to be, right? This you know, that whole product process, uh, yeah. you know, value, is, is that, is that going to be a premium in a way when other things are equalized, right? That, and we didn't even get into it, but we could spend a whole nother three hours talking about just the way that which the metrics that we right now use to uh, understand and project potential, right, are going to change or should change if uh, uh, they, if, 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 a computer can outperform a human being on it, what does it actually tell us, right? It doesn't tell us anything. It tells us that what you're good at is actually not very valuable anymore. Well, Enjoy. and what skills do we want them to be bringing the table, bringing to the table when they're telling the computer what to do, right? So they need to be able to work with AI. They need to be able to think about it, but then they do need to think about those bigger questions around humanity mm -hmm. and what's good for humans that doesn't always align with corporate bottom line. Like, you know, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of there there. Um, I do think our schools are better positioned to be doing that work and thinking about that work and in really engaging in conversations with kids. We're better positioned to do that than pretty much any sector of schools and education out there. But that's going to be pretty scary. You know, that's a different, it's a different kind of skill set. And we have to be able to say, I don't know, but let's have these conversations together, right? Let's talk about how we talk through this and what do we owe our fellow countrymen? What do we owe the rest of humanity? What do we owe the rest of the planet? Um, I These are, they're really big questions. And, and that work, as we all know, like it doesn't start when kids are 15. It starts when they're pretty young about how do we just, how do we think about each other? How do we treat each other? And what are our expectations? Yeah, suddenly that philosophy major is actually going to make sense. And I'm married to one. Like it's That's actually going to be the conversations. Yes. Be there. Yes. Yeah. And which I completely agree. And I think what I also, amongst so many other things I'm trying to wrap my head around, is these transformations and these changes that you're talking about, and I completely agree. And the rate at which they're going to come, you know, again, this is not like oh, this, is a, this is a today problem. This is yes. a, I'm looking at my son and I'm thinking, man, I hope I didn't mess this up because you're going to be building these systems. You're going to be you are going to be the front line. You're going to be those one of those early forerunners who's adopting this and who's thinking about this and who's going to be directing this. And when I look at corporate America and think, okay, they're going to be the ones directing and encouraging him and incentivizing certain behaviors or outcomes. And so does he and his generation have the wherewithal to draw the lines they need to draw if things are not going right. in a healthy direction? Well, and, and I completely agree. And, and it also makes me think, 
as a school, am I making decisions now that are going to be so outdated in two years? Not yes, you are. I promise you. I mean, I've we both probably made 30 of those this morning. I'm sure we get everybody, we just get everybody jumping in on the chat. Like who feels like they've already messed up today for five years? <laughs> Absolutely. Like totally. Yes. But I just, I just think it's, I just, you know, what are the, and, and this is not for an answer. I just, uh, you know, I think for us all to think about what, it, what are the investments that we need to be making, right? I, I'm thinking about just how you described what we need to do with kids and, you know, the questions we need to ask and lead them. That's so different than me trying to find the best math teacher ever because <laughs> you have this deep knowledge, right? If I can, if that's no longer going to be as necessary, but human connection is, and I, I mean, that's just, it's just. Well, but so but I, I do think that the cultures we build, I, I think a fundamental A fundamental outcome, a fundamental characteristic of our schools is it will have to be that they are healthy places for kids and adults to engage in healthy behaviors and relationships. Like we have to be modeling that, you know, kids sort of listen to what they say, they mostly follow what we do. And so that you're still going to need a teacher. I mean, and actually, you're going to need a teacher who understands a lot, probably a, a broader continuum of math. Um, but their their desire to model, their desire to engage with kids in appropriate and healthy ways and to talk through these things. You know, it's no longer, I don't know, Carla goes to the grocery store and buys, you know, 25 cantaloupes, right? Um, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you will be just deeper in those weeds and it's hard to create healthy environments in 2023. Um, you know, people still aren't quite right post-ish pandemic and you know how we model that how we create those scenarios and how we talk about responsibility to create those spaces I think is going to be crucial yeah and that again we could spend a whole nother thing on this on this collision of burnout <laughs> and acceleration all at the same time I mean yes yeah yeah you and I get excited about this like there's plenty of people they see us coming excited about something and they're like oh man I gotta go down the other hallway because I can't talk to those guys right now yeah, yeah I can't do it yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy um all right we're, we're approaching the hour mark so I, I have kind of two more questions I want to make sure we get to one would be are there any as you think about this and whatnot are there questions areas subject matters where you think schools need to stop right now and start having conversations about or ask themselves you know, look, are, are, are there areas that school leaders now, right now, need to be having conversations about beyond just how cool this could be or that we might all die because of a paperclip? <laughs> I don't want to die because of a paperclip. Um, I, you know, I think, you know, one of the questions that you asked is, you know, how do we prepare our teachers for AI? I think finding ways for adults to play with technology right now is crucial. Um, we we did a staff retreat. This was really very, very fun. And then we did something similar with the SEIS board. We went to a virtual reality gaming place just to play games together. You're not learning anything. You're not, I don't know, diagramming hippopotamus, like whatever. You are the SAS staff retreat. We got him a snowball fight. Um, we flew around Google Earth and you can do all these things together. Like, how do we start to play? And and how do we bring that back to our classroom? And like in a very non-threatening way. And I, I love the SEIS board. You were on the SEIS board. And like, and some of the biggest naysayers like, no, this is not my thing. And I don't like this. And like, what? And I mean, once they got it on and started playing, realizing like, you know, and, and it was so funny. The one board member, she's like, no, I need that. I didn't do that well enough. We're playing Angry Birds, and she's like, "I want to do it over." And you know, but it was, and she really didn't want to do it. But like, and then she figured out stuff about the game we couldn't figure out. If you ever played Angry Birds on your phone, like this is three dimensional, so there are actually ways for you to fly over the Angry Birds thing, and you can go around the sides because there's no, there's no limitation. There's no, it's not a, it's not a screen. You're just you're everywhere, and those kind of opportunities that playing I mean it builds connections with each other it builds trust but it also we have to have permission to do that like if we're going to learn how to do this from a student vantage point we have to be 
kind of taking the time to play with that and letting kids show us how to do some of those things. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I think, I think that like getting everybody and it's a little bit out of their comfort zone, but doing it in a non-threatening way, I think that's really going to help us figure out some of these issues. Um, we've got to figure out assessments in a better way because kids are, they're going to use these tools. And so creating assessments where they do use the tools and, you know, use this tool to do this and then show what you learned, you know, and, and, and then finally, probably don't start with no. Um, one head said, you know, a teacher asked, you know, can I use chat GPT to help put comments on papers? And the first was like, whoa, like that. And, and, you know, if we provide feedback on papers so that students can learn from the feedback, why wouldn't you use a tool that's adding to your feedback? So, you know, the teacher's not saying, can I just have chat GPT do this and email the kids? Teacher goes through and looks at the feedback, adds their own feedback, but that's additional feedback the students are getting for a better product in the long run and for more learning in the process. So, we're going to have to shift our mindset, I think, to say like, okay, how can we streamline some of these things? And heads are starting to do it. One head sort of surreptitiously said, you know, I gave two talks the other day. One was written by chat GPT and one was written by me. And my audience couldn't tell, you know, the, the, the staff that were in both of those couldn't tell which was which, you know, and he dressed up the chat GPT one for more of his own language, but he said, you know, one took me four and a half hours. The other one took me about 45 minutes. And like, what, what am I losing by doing that exactly? And so when we're working with kids, we're bringing that, <laughs> what we're bringing that into, you know, our spaces. So how, like, how are we acknowledging that with kids? If we pretend it's not there or we try to ban it from campus or we go back to Blue Book and all that kind of thing, mostly kids think that we're moving into a relevancy and we can't we can't do that. Do they still need to learn how to think and write? Uh, absolutely. Like I believe all of us like a confirmed English major married to a philosophy major. I do believe that, but I think we need to start thinking more deeply about the work that we're giving them. And then it's, it's not busy work. It's actually stuff they need to do and they understand why they're doing it. Yeah. As you, as you were talking, it made me think that maybe this is an opportunity to stop thinking of assessment as the end goal and actual learning as the goal. God help us. Um, but I think you're so right. I mean, who cares how you get there as long as you get there in a way that's ethical, a way that's productive, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I completely agree. And I think your point about relevance is so important too. Tying it back to a, a place of well-being, if you don't feel like it's a relevant, if you don't, if it feels irrelevant, there's no way to feel safe and comfortable and authentic. Well, and you have no purpose, yeah. right? I mean, there's no, okay, so you're writing another paper about Hamlet. And I don't know how many papers I've written about Hamlet, but- like what's, why, why are we doing these things? And I think this generation of kids coming up, they're going to ask us about that more. Right. I yes. think they're already thinking about it, but I think they're going to ask about it. And I think that's, those are big existential questions for us. Yep. Why do we ask them to do the things that they're doing? And how do we know that it's actually doing what we think it's doing? Um, we haven't had to ask those questions for a long time. And I think they're, I think they're hard ones. Yep. And, and I, I feel like some of our, and I would put myself in this category, some of our most successful schools are going to have the hardest time because the rite of passage of writing that paper on that, 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 you know, you don't ask because the, the results that we get are so clear and obvious, but those results may not be as aligned with, because um, last thing I'll say before my final question is um, I, I, everything, yes. And if we had more time, I'd go into the whole like operations of schools and how that could change. Because I think the silver line to some degree is if we could figure this out and do this well, we can gain back so much time yes. to give ourselves the opportunity to ask these questions and make this shift. And, you know, Google last week kind of finally started to lay out what it's going to do for Google Drive. Oh my God, I just cannot wait to not write an email anymore. Yeah, have you seen the new little thing that shows up on the site? Like, you yes. know. It'd be amazing yes. yes like i can't wait to just ask what does the handbook say like i don't even have to look at it just tell me what you know policy i've ignored and you know it's just 
It can be amazing. So I think that's also- well, But that yes. wellness piece, don't forget, right? Like, so we're really good at using technology to create more work and to accelerate more work. But how do we create more time in the system for actually deep thought and more centering and not just more, 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 more? Um, I think we're not great at that. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I, I, I did have this like horror of like, we're only going to generate more emails. Like, and they're like, it'll be this like weird meta thing where the emails. Right, right. I, right. I have my AI creating emails to send to you and you have your AI right. creating emails to send back and we're not actually having any right. kind of meeting of the minds whatsoever. Yes. Exactly. I, I worry about that profoundly. Yeah. Oh. All right, Deborah, this was so amazing. So amazing. Um, all right, final question. Uh, uh, and to your credit, you told me to make sure as I go through this, I should have a, the same question for everybody. And so I love that. So, and I, Full disclosure, I think I sent this to you ahead of time, but I'd love three things, either you're watching, reading, listening to, what 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 three things would you send us all away with? So I, um, I'm, I'm reading Gallup's Blind Spot and it's sort of the study of happiness and like how none of us saw this downturn in happiness coming. I think it came out maybe in November-ish. I've actually sent it to a few people and knowing the people I sent it to, they probably have already finished reading it and I'm like just getting going on it. But it, yeah, it's called Blind Spot. Um, I'm a big Scott Galloway fan. I listen to Scott Galloway a lot. I get a lot of his newsletters. Um, he's got a few different podcasts. I listen to the Prof G podcast. He was he taught at Stern for a long time. I don't know if he still does. I bet he still does some kind of a class there. And he's got a newsletter called No Mercy, No Malice. Um, he has he has a little bit of what my grandmother would call salty language. Um, but I I think he's ridiculously funny. I mean, I I routinely laugh out loud when I'm I'm listening to him walking around the the neighborhood. Um, and you know the um, there's a book that I read recently. I read a lot of I read a lot of fiction. It's actually like a deal I make with myself. I um, I read, and it can be brain candy. It can be serious fiction. And there's a book, and there's a Netflix series off it called Fleischman's in Trouble. Mm -hmm. And it's really inappropriate in a lot of ways. Have you read the book? Have you? Yeah, have you, so great. Yeah. So, but what really struck me about that book, um, and for those you should, you know, those who are interested, you should check it out. Um, the what really struck me is is sort of the the tension that the one of the main characters has about how he and his wife had certain values, but as their kids were living this life that they set for themselves, it's based in New York City, so in New York City. They'd actually never taken the time to articulate their values to their children. And I think about that a lot. Um, I think about it for parents, but then I think about it for schools. They see us doing certain things, like whether it's, you know, the college admissions process, the high school admissions process, like what job do you have? Like, how are you going to define your life later? And, and talking to kids about, you know, the school's mission, vision, and values helping them develop their own values and vision and idea of purpose over time. I think that's going to get more crucial, not less. And so if somebody wants like a lighter read, it's just a really interesting kind of like subtext that plays through that book that I just can't seem to get away from that thought. I don't know why that really grabbed my attention, but, but it did. I read it a couple months ago and I, and I just keep thinking back to that book with my own children but then how we think about what we articulate in education and what we show kids is important. Um, I love that. And it just shows your superior intellect because I just loved kind of the raunchiness of that book. Oh, no, I mean, it was totally, yeah. Like for anybody who like doesn't want like a raunchy romp through uh, fiction, do not read that book by any stretch of the imagination. It gets a little bit colorful in different places, but there's some fascinating character tensions in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you're right. There's so much that we just assume through osmosis that our own kids and our students just know. And yeah, they don't necessarily. No, no. particularly like if you told them like in an afternoon carpool on a Tuesday, like that may stick with them. Yeah, yeah. it really may not. Yep. Um, well, Deborah, this was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this thank you. This is like fabulously fun. I love having these conversations. So, and I, 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 ho I hope it fulfilled some of what you what you were talking about. Um, oh yeah. Oh no. It's just energized me. I think this is great. And I think, uh, I, and I appreciate you, though you always do, uh, giving your time to LD schools. 
too, right? Because I think I, as you know, LD schools have a special spot mm -hmm. in my heart. And LD schools tend to experiment with more people during the pandemic, you know, as everybody's creating multiple, they're like, I've never done three budgets. I'm like, oh, hook up with your LD school friends. Yeah. They're routinely running three or four budgets on any given school year. So exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to seeing what these schools do with AI and how that you know, how it marries into the good work LD schools already do. I completely agree. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you, Josh. I appreciate it. And I look forward to the next time. All right. Thank you.